Hello everyone. Welcome to Legacy AS Academy. <clears throat> Welcome to this initiative where we are talking about the most important topics in anthropology for 2023 mains examination. People who have cleared the UPSC prelims 2023 examination, very congratulations to you and stay tuned for all the videos in this particular playlist where we will be talking about important topics. There are high chances of these topics being again asked in the UPSC mains examination of 2023. Okay, so we are done with the first video where in our first video I discussed about the 9.1 unit in the paper 1. Okay, so we are done with it. So in this particular video, I will be completing the entire unit 9 where the content is so huge, there are chances that you would get a, you would have got carried away with this particular unit. Okay, so the content is so huge, it looks so much when you look at the syllabus copy. So I will be telling you the most important topics that you will have to be very much thorough with, okay, the most expected questions for 2023 mains exam. Starting with the physical anthropology unit 9 to unit 12. So if you have not watched the previous video, so I would strongly recommend you to go back, watch the video that we have done, the first video where I have talked about unit 9.1 and then continue with this particular video. Let us look at the first question, okay, the first most important topic for 2023 mains exam. I would say it is our DNA technology that is recombinant DNA technology which is also called as our DNA technology would be considered as the most important topic in this particular unit. So what is our DNA technology? Initially for the first time whenever you are talking about the RDNA technology when you are answering a question on it, the first thing that you will have to do is the definition. So define our DNA technology that is recombinant DNA technology. What does it mean and who was the one who started it? Paul Burke in the year 1973 for the first time for the first time came out with the concept of recombinant DNA technology and he was the one who used it for the practical purpose. Okay, so two things must this particular definition and also the name Paul Berg in the year 1973. Then you will have to discuss some of the steps that are involved in the recombinant DNA technology. Okay, I will just be giving you the brief subheadings and the definition and also the explanation two or three lines on each of these, these steps you will have to write it. The first one isolation, what is isolation? We deal with, will, will we isolate, will isolate the required or the desired gene or the DNA material, selection of the vector selection of the particular vector will have different different types of vectors and will have to select the particular vector. Preparation of the RDNA and then implanting the RDNA, implanting the RDNA and cloning it to get the desired material. So these are some of the important steps that are involved in the recombinant DNA technology. Okay, starting with what are the applications? See this, the next subheading will be the applications and we will also have to discuss about the disadvantages. Okay, you will have to write about the disadvantages if at all the DNA recombinant DNA technology has been asked in the exam. Starting with GM crops, okay, what are these GM crops? If you look at GM crops, that is genetically modified crops. For example, uh, if you know that any one particular agricultural crop, for example, let us take rice. See, rice if it is very much prone to any particular disease or pest, if at all that particular gene or DNA which gets affected because of the pest, if it is removed or if it is made more stronger, then there are high possibilities that that particular paddy crop or a rice crop would, would become pest resistant. So in order to develop drought resistant, in order to develop pest resistant varieties of the agricultural crop, recombinant DNA technology will play a very, very crucial role. Okay, this is the first one. Second, gene therapy. See, there are something called as chromosomal disorders. We will be talking about those chromosomal disorders. In order to solve those chromosomal disorders, in order to make sure that there is a medicine for such chromosomal disorders, that is called as gene therapy. If you want to alter something in the level of gene, at the level of gene, if at all there is any alternation, alternatives that would be possible to, to resolve the disorders, 
that is through gene therapy third clinical okay with respect to clinical we can talk about uh, prenatal and also the postnatal like for example what is prenatal prenatal we talk about if at all the embryo has been diagnosed with any disorder how do you how do you overcome it how do you solve that that is prenatal same thing with the postnatal after the birth of the baby okay that is clinical and finally something all of us can relate to is in the field of vaccination for example covid 19 vaccine let's take or one of the most practical applications of the recombinant dna technology is insulin the production of insulin that's happening world over okay the production of insulin that's happening world over to treat diabetes is the biggest example or the biggest application of recombinant dna technology okay the next important topic that we're going to discuss that we are going to discuss is something called as lethal and sublethal genes see normally if you would have not heard about if you not studied biology in detail there is no chance that you will hear about this particular term that is lethal and sublethal genes okay so what are these lethal and sublethal genes see the definition is very simple those genes if at all it is present in your body and if it because of its presence it's causing harm to the body or it might cause some disorder to the body or it might cause in the worst case scenario it might even cause the death of the human body so such genes just because of its presence it causes death is called as lethal genes okay simple this should be the definition that you'll be writing and you'll be writing an exam experiment in the, in the form of a case study called as q not case study okay this is a very important case study that you'll be writing for lethal and sublethal so what did the q not do q not did this he took he took the heterozygous yellow mice okay heterozygous yellow mice correct so he crossed it this is how you will get it and he observed and he observed over a period of time he got to know that this homozygous allele which is capital y capital y okay this did not survive or this died okay the other three of course yes these survived and this mice died and then he concluded this mice died because this y the capital y that we have in the heterozygous situation or in a heterozygous condition this is called as a lethal gene here it became homozygous and it started dominating because of that homozygous condition because of that homozygous condition this caused the death of the mice so this is a very important q not experiment and you will have to have to write this box you will have to uh, explain that because of this homozygous getting accumulated in the recessive condition this caused the death of the mice clear this is the q not experiment here next we'll have to talk about the types of lethal and the sublethal genes see the lethal genes are of different types we have sublethal we have we have uh, super lethal we have conditional lethal we have vital and we have super vital genes so all that you will have to write about the type you will have you can make a flow chart like this okay lethal and sublethal clear clear and you can also keep writing down like this so this is how you will have to represent this particular flow chart of the types of lethal and the sublethal genes and we'll also have to write about the applications what are the applications of what are the uses advantages of this lethal or the sublethal gene do we have some advantages of course yes do we do have some advantages see because of this lethal genes in the homozygous condition look at this here because the lethal genes are in the homozygous condition here this caused the death of the individual if it was in the heterozygous condition here this did not cause any disorder clear so this individual and this individual there was no disorder at all there was no problem at all only because of this homozygous condition this resulted in the death of the individual and if it is in the heterozygous condition if at all the lethal genes are in the heterozygous condition it is always beneficiary because they become they become resistive to some diseases like for example like for example people who have this heterozygous lethal gene concept 
they are very much resistant to malaria okay very much resistant to malaria so these are some of the advantages of lethal and the sublethal genes okay next concept is consanguineous and the non consanguineous marriages clear see what are these consanguineous and the non consanguineous marriages consanguineous marriages are the marriages that happen between two closely blood relatives like for example father marrying daughter or mother marrying son though this might sound very weird these are the practices that are present in some of the primitive tribes okay brother marrying a sister two close parallel cousins getting married so all these are the examples of consanguineous marriages so you will have to define initially in the introduction you will have to define what these consanguineous marriages are and the second sub topic will be the causes of these consanguineous marriages what are the different causes why do primitive communities some of the primitive communities or also some of the aristocratic communities who are in the royal blood why do they resort why do they go for consanguineous marriages for example you might have some causes like uh, the family doesn't want the wealth to get split okay the wealth should remain with the family if at all there is a marriage happening between uh, two distant individuals or strangers there are chances that the royal family the, the property would have got, would have got transferred or would have got divided but if it's a consanguineous marriage there's no there's no problem of property being split and second important thing is that there are there are very very less choices of finding a mate so that you go for consanguineous marriages so like this if you come up with four to five causes for the consanguineous marriages then you will be writing it here then we'll also talk about the effects of the consanguineous marriages see any any event for that matter will all will always have positive and the negative things the positive things with respect to consanguineous marriages is that if at all the bride has got married to a very close a relative or a parallel cousin okay not a cross cousin or any cross cousin also you can consider a very close cousin then you will have the cultural similarities the families are very well known from ages together like 20 years 30 years though those two families are having a connection because of that reason the adaptation becomes really easy for this particular bride or this particular groom for that matter clear so such such positive things are also there with consanguineous marriages and more than the positive things there are a lot of negative things look at the diseases that would get accumulated over a period of time as a result of accumulation of homozygous recessive alleles resulting because of the consanguineous marriages we have retentis pigmentosa a very dangerous disorder albinism and cystic fibrosis so all these get accumulated or get developed in an individual over a period of time as a result of consanguineous marriages homozygous recessive alleles get accumulated whenever you have the accumulation of the homozygous recessive alleles we have seen there are high chances of lethal genes being present and if at all the lethal genes are in the heterozygous condition that very much helpful to us and once the lethal genes become a part of the homozygous allele then it causes death of the individual effect on the fertility iq and the blood type okay what is the effect of the consanguineous marriages on the fertility what would get reduced iq very less blood type accumulation of recessive alleles again so more than the positives you will have to show in your answer the negative aspects of the consanguineous marriages okay so you can conclude by saying because this was known initially for the ancient indians they we come we came out with a concept called as gotra system this can be your conclusion and as a part of the gotra system what do we do intra gotra marriages the the marriages happening between the individuals of the same gotra very much prohibited according to hindu tradition okay so this gotra system promotes promotes diversity in the population also variation because of that that the offsprings who are born will not be suffering from any of these disorders okay so this is with respect to consanguineous and non consanguineous marriages the next topic and a most important a very very important topic is a chromosomal aberrations see what are these chromosomal aberrations whenever we talk about the chromosomes 
we know that we have 2n number of chromosomes. What is this 2n? We have 23 pairs of chromosomes who are split into 22 and 1, which means we have 46 chromosomes. We have 46 chromosomes. Out of that, 44 are called as autosome and 1 is called as allosome. Autosomes are the chromosomes which work towards which work towards the daily functioning of the body, ongoing functioning of the body. Okay, these are these are also called as non-sex chromosomes. Correct. At the same time, we also have allosomes that is X and Y, X and Y, two chromosomes. Correct. So these are called as sex chromosomes. Because these are the one which determine the sex of an individual. If at all it is an XY combination, you have a male. If you have XX combination, you have a female. What if? What if? If it is XXY. Clear? What if? What if? It is XYY. You can't have XYY. That's a different story because there is just one Y chromosome out of these two. But I'm just giving you an example, hypothetical one. Correct? What if what if it is XXY? What if it is XXXY? Triple XY. Instead of having 23 pairs, instead of having 23 pairs, what if you miss one chromosome and you just have 22 pairs? Or instead of having 46 chromosomes, what if you have 45 chromosomes? What if you have 45 chromosomes? This is one, one disorder. Instead of having 46, what if you have 47? There is one addition of a chromosome. So any such situation starting from double XY, triple XY, 45, 47, all these are called as chromosomal aberrations. Okay, Aberration in the sense, just a deviation from the standard. That is chromosomal aberrations. And chromosomal aberrations are of three important types and you will have to write this down. Very, very important. Numerical aberrations and structural aberrations. Numerical aberrations are these, 45 and 47. These are numerical aberrations. X, X, Y and triple X, Y. Numerical. Okay, there are, there are changes in the number of the chromosomes. Numerical. Structural. If at all, if at all, you have a chromosome like this. This is a typical chromosome that looks like. For example, what if? You have a chromosome like this. These two are not present at the bottom. These are structural aberrations. At the same time, we have monosomy and trisomy. I told you about 45 and 47. If at all, in an individual, there are, there are 45 chromosomes in, instead of 46, then it will be called as a monosomal condition. If it is 47, it will be called as trisomal condition. Okay, that is monosomy and trisomy, autosomal and allosomal disorders. Out of these 23 pairs, that is 46, if there is any aberration with respect to these 22 pairs of chromosomes, those are called as autosomes, then we call it as autosomal aberrations. If at all any disorder with respect to these allosomes, sex determinant chromosomes, we call it as allosomal aberrations. Okay, like this, we have a lot of examples, Down syndrome, Tau syndrome, Edwards syndrome, okay, Klenfelter syndrome, Turner syndrome. So you will have to know the characteristics of all these and you will be, you should be in a position to map those particular disorders with these three broad headings. If I tell you Down syndrome, is Down syndrome numerical or structural? Is Down syndrome monosomy or trisomy? Is Down syndrome natosomal or allosomal? If you get this clarity with respect to the chromosomal aberrations, then probably you will be in a better position to score very good marks in the mains exam. Okay. Next concept of race and racism. Clear? So, what is this concept of race? What is this concept of racism? First, in the introduction, something that, is, that should be there as a part of your introduction is the definition of the race given by D.N. Majumdar. D.N. Majumdar says race can be defined as a group of individuals just by possession of some characteristics can be identified in a 
whole lot which means there will be some group of people because they're having some certain characteristics because of those characteristics you can identify them in the whole lot of people whole lot of population this is what dn majumdar said when he defined race okay this is something that you will have to write and when we talk about race you should know about the races of the world so in the entire world the races are classified into two one we call it as major races second is minor races major and minor what is what is this major race major race are caucasoid clear negroid mongoloid these are the three important major races that we have minor races we have sudanese we have dravidian clear so these are some of the minor races and what is this race based on see the race is based on purely on the biological and the physical characteristics like for example nasal index cephalic index that is the head shape head form the form of the nose the shape of the nose clear the shape of the face the hair texture hair color skin color clear eye eye color clear so all these are some of the physical features that we use to classify people based on the race and remember it has nothing to do with the culture nothing to do with the culture clear if there is a myth that the people of caucasoid are more intellectuals and the people of the negroid are not intellectuals that's a myth see the racism is completely a cultural concept this is something that we have created by nature we don't have anything called racism the unscientific discrimination which is based on the race is called as racism which is unscientific clear so you, th these these words should be very very strong in your answer that's what the examiner also looks looks at unscientific discrimination between the people of different races which is proportional to their capabilities is called as racism okay and the racism is a myth and unesco unesco has given nine important pointers on the racism unesco says there is no no nothing called as greater race there is nothing called as lower race unesco says all the variations that we have between the humans all the variation that we have either is because of inheritance or it is because of the environment it has nothing to do with our physical capabilities clear so these are some of the things that the unesco says and these nine point out of these nine pointers if you can substantiate the concept of race and racism with four to five pointers it would be a great answer correct <clears throat> and the last ecological anthropology and a very easy easy one and a very interesting one here the entire ecological anthropology deals with two important terminologies that is adaptation versus acclimatization so we should know what is adaptation and what is acclimatization for example adaptation if you just take what is adaptation adaptation is a permanent phenomena acclimatization is a temporary phenomena for example if you sweat because of the heat that's acclimatization okay usain bolt being able to run for a long speed for a very high speed and for a, or for example the athletes from uh, kenya okay athletes from kenya who are very well known for the long run marathon runners that is adaptation see which means just just remember adaptation is a permanent phenomena acclimatization is a temporary phenomena that will be more than enough and we will have to look at the adaptation and acclimatization with respect to three important geographies that is altitude heat and the cold which means how do humans adapt to higher altitude how do humans adapt to greater heat and how do humans adapt to cold situations that's what the topic talks about altitude how do we acclimatize how do we adapt you'll we'll have to write two or three important case studies one is about the raramuri runners raramuri runners are the runners or a particular tribe which is present in the north america here these are the people who are very much capable of running for kilometers together 20 kilometers 25 kilometers 30 kilometers doesn't matter to these people and they run barefooted that's a very important phenomena about the raramuri runners because these are the people who have been born brought up genetically inherited higher lung capacity and their oxygen carrying capacity is very good that they don't get tired easily and we'll have to talk about the kenyan athletes i told you about the kenyan athletes the long term long distance runners maithali mukherjee and bhavana parashar the case study where they have come to a conclusion 
that with the people who have been born and brought up throughout the ages with the high altitude or hilly terrain, their oxygen carrying capacity, a gene responsible for the oxygen carrying capacity is present and it's very effective because of the presence of this particular gene, they are able to survive and they are able to run faster. There is one more case study of Patoshi High, a Spanish island, okay, a Spanish island in the South America, Patoshi High, where people over a period of time, over 50 years down the line, did not have even a single live birth because Patoshi High is on a mountain, they are here. And these people did not have a live birth for 50 years. As soon as the child was born, it was, it was, it was some, some, some child, some fetus was dead uh, or uh, the child died after few weeks. So such disorders were present with this particular community. Okay. So what did they do? They came out with a technique where whenever the woman is pregnant, they used to come down and live here on the ground, escaped. They just escaped from the extreme weather condition at the top of the hill. So this is an example of how people adapt or acclimatize for the high altitude. Okay, this is one more example, Patoji High case study of Spanish island. Heat, thermal gradient, any, for example, whenever the temperature is high in the surroundings. Okay, so in order to regulate the body temperature through, through the skin, skin will be the medium for the regulation of the body temperature. So the body, takes the difference between the body temperature and also the environmental temperature. So this difference is called as thermal gradient. Whenever you have the thermal gradient, you start sweating and whenever you sweat, whenever you sweat, the body gets cooled. Okay. So you will have to mention about the Bergman's rule and the Allen's rule, which talk about people who are born and brought up in the high temperate regions where the temperature is very high, they'll have longer extremities clear. They'll have the long surface area, their surface area in the body is so long that it helps them to regulate heat, it helps them to lose heat. At the same time, people who are born in the colder regions, for example, Eskimos, they are not so tall, their extremities are not so long and because of their reduction in the surface area, because of their reduction in the surface area, the heat loss is also less. Whenever the heat loss is less, the body can preserve heat and body can regulate the heat mechanism. This is Allen's rule that talks about in the cold regions clear so very simple concepts and there are chances that these concepts can be asked for a 15 marker and also 20 marker cold regions vasoconstriction in the hot region whenever the blood the blood vessels would get expanded at the same time in the cooled regions vasoconstriction happens and you start shivering because of shivering the body regulate the body creates some heat because of that we are able to overcome the extreme cold mechanism or extreme cold temperature clear so this is with respect to ecological anthropology and the entire unit 9 clear so we have completed entire unit 9 we have one video of unit 1 9.1 and this video talks about the entire unit 9 so we'll be coming up with one more video where i'll be talking about unit 10 unit 11 and unit 12 in the paper 1 so we'll have one more video of Tribal Anthropology Unit 6, 7, 8, 9 in Paper 2. Clear? If you have liked the video, please hit the like button and uh, subscribe to the Legacy Eyes Academy for more such updates. And also do not forget to click the bell icon to get all the latest, latest updates from Legacy IS. Have a nice day. Thank you.